How camest thou in hither, not having on a wedding garment? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Dear faithful, have you recently been invited to a wedding, um, a marriage in the world? You realize that, of course, it's even the custom today that people are obliged to change their clothes for that day because there's a color of the day and even a style of the day so that people are obliged to be immodest on that day because of the style chosen for the day. Imagine that. And of course, somehow they change their clothes because of the color of the day in order to, to show that they are sharing in the joy of the bride and the bride and the groom. The bride and the bridegroom. Alright? So and of course, perhaps those who are uh, who could not afford the color of the day and the uniform will be ashamed to present themselves in a dirty or shady clothes among those who are making merry and celebrating a happy event for the day. From the gospel of today's uh, reading, the reading of today's gospel, we, we see that someone, though he was invited like others, he dared to attend the wedding feast without a wedding garment. And what happened to him? He was bundled up and thrown out into the outer darkness. St. Gregory says that we should understand this, the kingdom of God that is likened to a, this wedding phase, we should understand needs to be the church today, which is comprised of what? Both the good and the bad. A mixture of good and bad people. So, he who comes to the wedding feast without a wedding garment belongs to the church by faith, of course, just by faith, but he has no charity, which is the wedding garment. You show you by external profession, you manifest yourself to be Catholic, you join the mass, you join procession, you receive all the sacraments and all of that. Externally, by faith, you are attending the wedding feast as such. But if you have no charity, then you do not have the wedding garment. That is what St. Gregory explains to us. Now, here we are, present at the marriage feast of the world made flesh. We who hold the faith within the church, we are fed by the Holy Scriptures and rejoice in the union of the church with God. You see, we are here participating in this marriage feast. We must be careful to clothe our hearts with the rich robe of charity. And this robe, this garment that must be double dyed with the love of God and the love of our neighbor. <clears throat> when we consider this obligation to clothe our hearts with the robe of charity, we, we want to pause and ponder on the sixth horseman of spiritual death, envy, which is a sin against charity. Envy, what is it? Perhaps we, we have used the word several times that ah, this person is envious of me or you are envious of this person, things like that. It is jealousy or grief over a neighbor's good because it surpasses yours or it obscures your own good. It is what? a sadness or annoyance at, the, at a neighbor's temporal or spiritual good because it seems to you that his spiritual or temporal good 
is what it, it lessens your own. You think that when you look at what the other person has, you begin to feel that his own is more than yours, and you begin to envy his, something like that. Let us recall that this sin of envy was the sin of those who caused Christ's death. You see, even Pilate realized this. We read that he, Pilate, knew that they had delivered him up out of envy. That is Matthew 27 verse 18. Also, envy was the envy of the devil brought about death into the world. In the book of wisdom, we read that by the envy of the devil, death came into the world. Envy, as we have noted, is opposed to charity. You see, St. Paul tells us that charity does not envy in, in his scheme of charity, 1 Corinthians 12. So in verse 4, you see where he spoke about envy. So, but what is the source of envy? What, where does it come from? Simple, pride. Pride and disordered self-love. Remember, we spoke about a legitimate self-love some time ago, but envy comes from a disordered self-love. And this envy, spiritual authors will tell us, and even from our own experience, we know it, that frequently is found in those suffering from inferiority complexes. They just, they just feel themselves inferior, have this complex, and so every other person is the subject of their, the out object of their envy. Of course, we know that envy is the cause of many other evils. For instance, slander and calumny, when you begin to make false spoken statements that are damaging to another person's reputation. And envy makes people to begin to slander the other or speak with calumny against the other. Envy makes people to rejoice over the misfortune of others, imagine, or you begin to persecute someone you perceive to be your rivals. You see people who are traders, or there's even a story of two traders who are opposite each other because they, they, they began to um, hate each other because of what? Competing um, customers. But now, one of them, who was a Catholic, one day went to, when he went to confession, he now asked the priest, he, he gave the story how he and this his neighbor are always quarreling because of customers. The priest told him, he now asked the priest, what is the solution to this? The priest said, well, I have the best solution to, you, to give you. It is not the easiest, but it is the best. Now, what was it? He said, each time a customer comes to your place and there's something you do not have and you know your neighbor has it, send the customer to your neighbor. And it was something tough for him to stomach, but he accepted the advice of the priest. He began to do that. The other neighbor realized that, oh, this person is sending customers to him. Then he now came to apologize, to beg him that he's sorry for how he has treated him in the past. Now it now became a kind of essence. When he too has a customer that has something or that needed something he has not, and he knows that his neighbor has that good, he will send a customer. And they became good partners in business. Their envy was gone. There was no need for them to to be envious of each other. They simply needed to be on uh, understanding and to collaborate to make better business. You can think about that even today, how you can apply it in your own life. That you don't need to start persecuting someone you think to be a rival. No. Rather, think of a way to do something good to that person and that will become the, the solution to your envy, you see that there was no reason to be envious of that person. 
those who are envious begin to belittle the merit of others while they, they raise their own merit before others. And of course, we know that envy destroys peace of mind and happiness. A person who is envious do not have, never has a peace of mind nor happiness. And envy, of course, threatens one's health. When you are envious of the person, other person and you are, have no rest of mind, of course, you are at, at risk of having heart attack. When you see the other person doing well, you begin to feel as if you, the earth should just swallow the person. And since the earth refuses to swallow the person, you'll be the one to suffer that pain. Poor you. No, don't give in to that. Rather, you should pray for the good of that person and free yourself from the threat of uh, envy, which, which the effect it has on your health. Of course, envy brings one into disfavor in the eyes of others. You see, after this person has spoken ill of Mr. B, every other person in society begins to see Mr. B in a certain light because of what Mr. A has spoken about him. And that work destroys friendship. It destroys teamwork and, of course, much good. Of course, Perhaps we know this from our own experiences in encounter with other people at different places. But what are the chief weapons against envy? Well, remember the cause is what? Pride. Therefore, the, one of the chief weapons against envy is simply deep humility. Deep humility. And because the second cause is this other self-love, the, the opposite, therefore, a chief weapon against it is what? A just self-esteem. That you see yourself as one of the fingers, they are not all equals, right? But each of them have their own place and right. The pinky will not be jealous of the tongue, nor the ring finger will be jealous of, um, of your index finger. No. Think of it that way. You have no reason. You should have a legitimate self-esteem. Accept yourself for who God has made you, your gift of nature and of grace, and rejoice in the good of the other. Congratulate them when they have achieved something and share in their own joy. Things like that. You should have a sincere and supernatural love for all men. This is how you overcome envy. Well, dear faithful, examine yourself and ask, is anything smelling of envy in your heart? Well, ask God to give you a true spirit of love for everyone, a true charity, especially toward those you envy, all right? We know that envy is not the wedding garment for the marriage of the feast of the Lamb, the feast of the Word made flesh. So now you have the time to get the wedding robe. Now is the opportunity for you to get that charity needed for you to be counted among those who should enjoy the feast in, the, in, 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 in eternity. Of course, Remember, the church now is composed of the good and the bad. But at the end of time, only the good will enjoy the marriage feast for eternity. So now is the time for you to get the wedding garment of charity. Strive to get it. Do not let yourself be found without the essential garment of charity, that Christ-like love. No, get faithful. Do not let it be addressed to you on that day. How comest thou hither not having a wedding garment? God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.